Thanks, Eric. Appreciate the introduction. Folks, you're going to be uh, able to hear from a medical doctor today who uh, we've associated with uh, just a while back because we wanted to be able to bring to you uh, someone who's actually been out there uh, struggling herself in private practice, uh, following all of the wrong uh, guidelines that there are to uh, run a business, uh, and just like every doctor does. And so she's going to share with you today her insight into this business. Now, let me just tell you a little bit about Dr. Vicki Ratner. Uh, she is a, a retired general surgeon, and uh, like I said, she was in practice for herself. She uh, outsourced her billing. Uh, and, and she's now a nationally noted expert, author, and speaker. Uh, during her uh, career, she created uh, and treated tens of thousands of patients herself, and, uh, and she was also a, uh, held a, cl a clinical faculty appointment at the University of Washington School of Medicine. At some point, she left the operating room. I'm going to let her tell you that story today. Uh, she wanted to help other doctors in their practice, and now she works with business professionals uh, in several different fields to help them partner more effectively with physicians that, that are out there. Uh, she's also uh, on the editorial board of Physicians Money Digest and has a regular column for physicians in that, uh, that uh, website. So with that, I'll uh, see if she can uh, join us here today. Welcome, Dr. Ragnar. Well, thank you so much, Patrick. It's a delight to be here with you today. Well, I think this is a real treat for people because, again, uh, a lot of folks who've been on our webinars have never actually heard from you, and uh, even though we've been associated for some time now, it's just uh, wonderful to uh, share your insight into this because, again, why don't you kind of start by just telling us a little bit about your background? All right. Well, it's a twisty story, but I'll try to make it brief. So I was actually in a graduate program when one day I fainted on my way to the bathroom. I was bleeding internally. Um, by the time the surgeons got into my body, about half of my blood volume was in my pelvis, so I really thought I was going to die. And I woke up in the recovery room just knowing I was going to be a doctor and save other people's lives like my own had been saved. Not surprisingly, I became a surgeon. And um, I went into private practice. Um, actually, one of the best choices that I ever made, I, I originally went in with one partner, but then there was a multidisciplinary breast team being formed at a different hospital. So I broke off and went on my own. And one of the best choices I made way back then was to outsource my billing. Because I had seen the kinds of struggles that my former partner had had, you know, having his wife doing the billing, having somebody who wasn't really trained. So um, I primarily, well, I was known for operating on two kinds of patients. The first kind of patient was a woman with breast cancer. The second kind of patient was somebody who had a hard time being heard. Um, I was called surgeon to the psychos. And um, <laughs> Did you say surgeon to the psychos? <laughs> that's right. That's right, because there are a lot of people out there who have problems. Doctors don't know what's going on, and they go from doctor to doctor. And I was usually the one who would finally actually sit down and listen to them and make a diagnosis. Oh, I see. And <laughs> I never heard you use that term before. <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway, I, um, I worked really, really hard getting my practice up and going. And then once I, I was finally there, it was time to start my family. And um, I, at 40, I gave birth. I had a plan. I converted one of my exam rooms to the nursery. And my office manager, who was the mother of four, was going to take care of my son while I was off operating. And that worked out okay until I couldn't really ignore the fact that my son was different than other children. And when he wasn't speaking, I pushed my pediatrician for um, an evaluation, and he was found to have broad spectrum developmental delay. Now, I had operated my whole pregnancy. I thought, what have I done to my son? He was enrolled in a special state-funded school, and I took a leave from my practice to put motherhood first, and then I supported my family by being an expert in medical malpractice lawsuits. Well, the great news is that my son's doing just great. He's, uh, you know, if you met him, he's a college student now, you would never guess that he had any sort of problem. But after that year, um, I was faced with the choice. What do I do now? Do I return to my surgical career? 
And I sort of thought to myself, how many people have been a doctor, a patient, a family caregiver, and have gotten a real um, insider seat about where care goes off track? So in 2000, I decided to start a consulting company helping doctors and patients collaborate more effectively to get better medical care at a lower cost. And I thought, man, I'm going to do so well with this consulting business, but I didn't. I really, really struggled. I started hiring mentors, going to marketing courses. I've spent about as much on my marketing and business career as I did in medical school. Wow. And um, so right now, this is still what I'm doing. And be, because I sort of have been in the world of medicine and in the world of business, I've built a bridge between the two. And so I help people like you who want to build business relationships with doctors understand what they're really about. And I'm also helping doctors conduct themselves in a more business-minded way. Now, that's not the language I use with them. What I tell them is that I help them return to the joy of medicine. So, so that's my story. I've seen healthcare from all sorts of different sides. And what I can tell you is that the thing that doctors most worry about right now is their income. And a lot of them are not set for retirement. They were counting on their high earning years in their 50s, and they're not seeing that. They're seeing their incomes eroded. And, and licensees of ABS often make the difference between a physician being able to retain their autonomy or sort of throwing in the towel and selling their practices to hospitals and clinic, which is not something that um, you know free spirits like myself ever wanted. We didn't go to medical school to have a boss. We wanted to be our own boss. Right. And yet that's happening to doctors right now. A lot of them are being uh, hired by the hospitals and groups and things like that. They don't really want that, but some of them don't have a choice because they have a problem, and we we happen to have the answer to that, of course, which is a good thing for us and for our licensees. So tell right. us about your uh, your latest book. Uh, you just published this recently, the the rich the myth of the rich doctor. I thought oh, all doctors were filthy this is rich. Much fun. This is kind of it's really really interesting to see the reaction to this. This started out as a blog post that kind of went viral. So I've spoken with a lot of doctors about their relationship with money. And what I really believe is that doctors are wired differently than business-minded people. And the core difference is their relationship with money. Like as a business person, you want to make sure that an investment in ABS is a good investment. You're going to get a return and, you know, be able to do all those things that you really want. Well, for doctors, they measure their success by their ability to serve. And quite often, that means that they're not making great business choices. For example, working with Patrick, what I've discovered is that a lot of doctors, probably myself included, walk away from about 30% of their practice. So, you know, if you're worried about billing, what do you do? Well, you think I'm, I'm going to do a better job of plugging cash leaks, but no, that's not what they do. They go to their banker and take out a line of credit. So they'll make sure that they can pay their bills. So I've seen doctors make some pretty crazy choices about money. And I've spoken with a lot of doctors. I've gotten a lot of their stories. And some doctors do really, really well. Other really smart doctors don't do very well. So I just reflected on all of these conversations. It's like hundreds, maybe close to a thousand. And I saw certain trends. So um, this book is basically what I've seen about doctors. It's kind of like the secrets about doctors and their relationship with money. And the bottom line is that there are an awful lot of doctors who, yes, make very, very good incomes, but don't make good decisions and have a hard time translating those high incomes to wealth and financial independence. So the so yes, and according to this chart here, the, a recent study, uh, some of them do make a, a lot of money uh, annually, but that doesn't mean they know how to manage it uh, and keep it. <laughs> That's right. So, so um, I know somebody. Actually, I've met him at a family event, and he was an orthopedic surgeon. He finished his career, then he went to law school. So he was doing medical malpractice. And I mean, both of these are really high paying fields. Orthopedic surgeons are towards the top of the list. And he always had the finest stuff, you know, great clothes, 
really expensive cars, a mansion and a summer home and boats and international travel. And then he died. And what they discovered is he left his wife nothing but debt. So it doesn't oh. matter how much you make, if you spend it all, you're not going to be able to build wealth. So when you look at a doctor, if you look at somebody from the outside, you don't know what's really happening in their inner financial truth. And there's an awful lot of sort of the millionaire next door kind of doctors. You know, the doctors like me who are driving 10-year-old cars and, you know, don't live in the fanciest home. Be why? Because we value financial freedom and we're working towards that instead of being showy and flashy. <laughs> right. Now, you know, when we were talking about this subject earlier, uh, the other day, you mentioned uh, something about your husband that I thought was interesting. Uh, do you mind sharing uh, a little bit about the uh, the experience that he had when he was looking to start his own business? Yeah, so my husband was a serial entrepreneur. I mean, he had jobs, but his dad had owned a shoe factory, and he just always knew he wanted to be his own boss. So he looked at a number of businesses. His dad was consulting, and um, back in the 80s, he bought a printing business, and it was a really good business at the time, very profitable. Um, but with the advent of computers, it became not so profitable. So he decided, you know, I, I'm going to need to make a change. So he looked at a lot of different businesses and made what he thought was a, a really good choice, which turned out not to be a good choice. And you know, while he was making this change, we were making the choice too, should I basically go into my own business? So there was a lot of uncertainty. We didn't have like, you know, we didn't have a clear path to knowing where our money was coming from. So it was kind of a scary time for us. But through these experiences, I really sort of feel like I might understand what you're going through. I mean, you're going to be making a big choice here, and there are a lot of consequences of this choice. You know, my husband turned out to have purchased a, a UPS franchise in an area around Microsoft that was expected to just boom around 2008, and it didn't. And so his business failed, basically, um, even though he had this name. So. I get that you really do want to do your due diligence. You want to make sure that you're making a great investment. And um, I personally think that you've come to the right spot for any number of reasons. Yeah, it, it is a big it is a big decision for people. I mean, uh, our investment of twenty six thousand is is not the end of the world. Obviously, there's franchises that are twice that and ten times that. But it's still a chunk of money, and I know people want to be very careful about that. So one of the things I wanted to talk with you today about, Dr. Vicki, is the, the three questions. And, and I'll, I'll just be honest. Uh, Dr. Vicki suggested these. She said, Patrick, if I were looking at getting into your business, the three things I'd want to know are these three things here. Is there a market for these services? Is there a possibility for high profit? And is there a proven path to success? That that's really all you're looking for in any business opportunity or franchise. So. Absolutely. And like I said, my husband and I went through this a number of times, you know, with his businesses, when he was looking at all sorts of other businesses. These, these were the questions we wanted to ask. We wanted answers to. And, you know, the UPS store, that's a pretty solid business, really. Um, there are some out there that if you, if you research the magazines and websites, uh, Dr. Vicki, you'll find all sorts of, what I call fad businesses. I mean, they may be really, really hot today, you know, but a year or two down the line, you go, you know, that, that will be, well, Blockbuster, there's a good example right there. You wouldn't want to get into Blockbuster right now, probably. <laughs> I guess they still have stores. I don't know. But the point is that this one is a, what I think of as a real business. I mean, as far as I know, as long as there are doctors and people who are sick, somebody has to bill somebody for the doctor to get paid. Absolutely. So um, if you look at what industries are growing, healthcare is one of the few that are growing. And it, like you just said, Patrick, it's going to be around. People are going to need doctors. Doctors are going to need to get paid. Personally, I, I know there's conversations about will we just go to a single payer system and 
will this all be moved? I don't see that happening personally. I think that just because we're in America, we're entrepreneurial, I believe there's going to be doctors who are seeing patients and who are billing for their services. So I, I see a pretty firm future for, um, for the services that you offer. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons that I've researched. Uh, we as a company are constantly looking at what's out there uh, and comparing it with what we have. And this article here, for example, this let's see, this is back in October, just October of last year. Uh, and as you can see, this article says that medical billing outsourcing, that's basically what we're in, right? The, you're, the doctors are outsourcing their billing to you to do the billing for them uh, as a licensee of ABS. Uh, it says it can reach $16.9 billion by 2024. So I, uh, I thought this article was worth reading uh, a little bit from it here because and I'd like to get your comments on a couple of things here, Dr. Vicki. Uh, for example, uh, I'm increasing my screen size here so I can actually read this. Uh, it says the medical billing outsourcing market valued at $6.3 billion in 2015 is expected to reach a value of $16.9 billion by 2024. Now, I don't know math that well, but that's a huge increase in just the next, uh, what, uh, seven years or so, right? Right. Yeah. right. And uh, so uh, let's see. It says also four takeaways from this report. Well, I've only got two here, but they're, they're pretty important. North America experienced the largest surge in its medical billing outsourcing market growth uh, in, in 2015, changing regulations and rising healthcare costs have driven interest in financial service providers. That's what our licensees are. We, we provide financial services for the doctor, which of course in this case is uh, doing their you know insurance billing. Uh, and then number two, a great a greater number of independent physician practices are consolidating to increase the market power and ensure financial stability. This trend has created a need for third-party financial management services to administer their increasingly complex revenue cycle needs. So, uh, Dr. V, uh, one of the things that we have asked from time to time is, well, aren't these doctors joining other big groups? And, and some of them are, they, like it says right here in number two. But that's not a good, that's not a bad thing for our licensees because our licensees have signed up some of those big groups. I mean, we just had one recently sign up a group of 36 doctors in a, in a practice. So, I, I guess that's the trend, though, that doctors are wanting to get together and, and not be just completely independent, but at least have two or three other doctors in, in the practice with them. Right. So um, there is a trend of consolidation. Hospitals are consolidating. Doctor practices are consolidating. There are hospitals and clinics that are purchasing practices. But like I said, there are a lot of people like myself who do not want to be an employee. So what do you do? You get together with other people who are like you, who are committed to retaining their autonomy. And a lot of these doctors are forming an IPA, an independent physician association. So it's a legal entity. And what you might not realize is that, you know, the insurance company doesn't pay every surgeon the same amount of money to do an appendectomy. These are all negotiated. And as you might imagine, the bigger the volume of the provider, if a hospital can say, look, we're going to do 2,000 appendectomies this year, they're going to be able to negotiate a better price than the individual doctor who only does a couple of a year. So this IPA is a legal entity that allows the doctors to go and negotiate for better costs and they can buy supplies at a better rate. So that, um, yeah, that, that's a good business decision. I, I would do that if, you know, and a lot of a lot of uh, types of businesses do that to get together to be able to buy at a better price. Right, and negotiate. Uh, so the advantage to them is that they are able to retain their autonomy. And hey, look, if you're working with an OBGYN in one of these IPAs, and you're delighting that OBGYN, you know what? Doctors gossip kind of like teenage girls. So they tell other people about you, especially if they're in a group. So when you get a doctor client, you know, think about throwing a pebble in a lake and watching the ripples go out. Just because doctors network together, your first doctor client makes it easier to get your second doctor client and then even easier to get your third. And pretty soon you become the known go-to person among a given group of doctors. 
I think that's probably the best thing about the doctor market personally. You, you know, that, I'm glad you just said that, Dr. B, but, but we actually experience that here at ABS all the time. We have licensees call us up. They're excited. They just signed up a new doctor. And when we ask them, well, how did you find that doctor? What marketing method that we taught you uh, did you go out and use? They go, well, nothing. I just, it was a referral, you know, from one of my existing clients because, like you said, they talk amongst one another. Uh, this is a study that we are quoting here from that actually Dr. Vicky pointed me to this Medscape uh, 2017 Physician Compensation Report. One of the things they asked was the hours that doctors spend on paperwork and administration. And I was shocked by this. I mean, look at this. 38% of doctors spend 10 to 19 hours a week on paperwork. Uh, to me, that that's like, what, what if we could just cut that in half, you know, so that they can spend another five uh, to nine hours a week helping patients. Uh, and of course, that's what our licensees do by taking the billing off of their hands. They free up the doctor and the staff to see more patients. That, that's got to be a win-win for everybody. Absolutely. And it's important to remember that we are seeing an epidemic of physician burnout. And this is one of the main reasons. You know, I went to medical school to treat patients. I didn't go to treat the chart. And any moment that I wasn't in front of a patient was a moment wasted as far as I was concerned. I wanted to spend as much time as possible with patients, not with the chart. I don't know if you've actually seen this quote I have on the screen there, Dr. Vicki, but uh, it, it kind of uh, verifies what you are saying in your book, The Myth of the Rich Doctor. Uh, doctors, are, are two out of three of them say that they're just squeaking by, or, or they're in the red financially. Have you found that to be true with the people that you work with that uh, are financial advisors and so forth? Um, so just to clarify, I work with financial advisors who help doctors build wealth because doctors need it. I mean, think about it. When you are wondering, how am I going to pay my mortgage? It's kind of hard to find joy in life. And I knew that if I wanted to help doctors get back to the dream that attracted them to a career in medicine, they had to have a solid financial foundation first. And so lucky me, I'm working with financial advisors who you know, help doctors translate their income to wealth. And then I, I was fortunate enough to have Patrick reach out to me and really talk about how doctors can optimize the inflow of money into their life. And, you know, once that happens, doctors have a lot more choices. So there are doctors doing really, really, really well. You know, plastic surgeons who are making $1.5 a year. I have a buddy who's an anesthesiologist. He had lymphoma, and he just donated a couple million dollars to the Lymphoma Research Association. So he's doing well. He's making wise investments, and he was in a position in his early 60s, you know, to give away a couple of million dollars. So there's doctors sort of all over the spectrum, and you can't really tell how a doctor is doing by looking from the outside, but you are going to be able to, you know, look under the hood and see how doctors are, are really doing. And there's a lot of doctors who are just like this. And you know what? It's embarrassing to be a smart doctor and to have your finances so out of control. Patrick, I love your story about the Porsche Gerard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I found when I was uh, actually calling on doctors, this has been, you know, 20 years ago or more, uh, that, that I, I found a, a lady there who uh, referred to uh, the doctor. It was a, a lady doctor who referred to the drawer where they put the rejected insurance claims, you know, that they got back from the insurance company, rejected, stamp rejected. They would put that in a drawer, and she referred to that as her Porsche drawer because she said, if I could get the money and, and all the claims in that drawer, I could buy that Porsche I've always wanted. Well, look, we're on this topic of uh, is there a market for these services? That's the first question that Dr. Vicki said she would be asking. You folks should be asking that question as well. So let me just show you real briefly here a, a comparison chart for what the doctor spends in-house because a lot, of, a lot of people actually say to us, well, can't the doctors do their own billing? Uh, and of course, some of them do. But that doesn't mean that they're saving money doing that. Uh, look, here's the in-house cost for doing billing for a doctor that is just doing 400 claims a month uh, times 12. That's, that's 12 months in a year at about $100 a piece. 
Uh, and at 6%, now folks, we're going to teach you exactly how you can price this out to doctors, but nationwide it'll run 5 to 8%, generally speaking, for what you'll charge the doctors for what's collected. And that would be only $28,800 that you would be charging the doctor for doing the billing. Look, if they do it in-house and they only have one and a half people uh, doing the billing, after you add in the payroll taxes, the workers' comp, and the insurance, and the errors and omission, and all these other things here, as you can see, uh, they all total up to a lot more money. So the question is, why would the doctor do this themselves? <laughs> why wouldn't they do it out, outside the office? Did you find that to be true, Dr. Vicki, in your own I did, practice? and I can tell you exactly why they don't outsource it. They're control freaks. You want your doctor being a control freak. And they <laughs> tend to think that if they keep it in-house, they'll have control. What they don't understand is that keeping it in-house can actually be quite risky. Did you know that the medical industry is one of the highest industries victimized by theft and fraud? So, you know, there have been office managers who have embezzled tens of thousands of dollars with like really creative bookkeeping. And um, doctors tend to be trusting people. Most of us have been taken advantage by somebody or another. And, you know, a, a sharp office manager could easily figure out a way of pocketing a lot of this money without the doctor even knowing. So, you know, sadly, we've actually heard that from licensees, that one of the reasons why some doctors have turned the billing over to them is they suspected that that was happening and then found out that, yes, it, it really was. And so they had to get rid of their office uh, person that was doing the billing. So... It's just hard to believe for me that somebody would be have the gumption, you know, to do something like that to a doctor. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Well, here's a quote from uh, Doug Brown, who's managing partner of the Black Book. Uh, they're a research firm. He says, rising healthcare expenditures and the complex technology uh, are staffing requirements to succeed undervalued based uh, under value based care, uh, which is what we're moving to is creating the urgent demand for cost-effective, technically advanced business office outsourcing solutions in physician practices across the country. Folks, this is exactly what we're teaching people in our workshops uh, to do. We're, we're teaching them to be technically advanced by giving them the latest in software, uh, cloud-based software, and they are the providing the business office outsourcing solutions to those doctors that are out there. So. Uh, it just happens to be that we're in the right place at the right time. Sometimes you're just in the right place. <laughs> yeah. And just to put sort of a more human touch on this, you know, one of the things that doctors really fear is being under the microscope. Um, and Medicare has made some pretty significant changes. And if there are irregularities in the billing patterns, this could potentially mean that a doctor could basically be investigated by Medicare. And I had somebody who was being evaluated and she said, they convinced me I was guilty. <laughs> you know, I even started to believe it. It's a terrible, terrible thing. And if you, if like doctors use the wrong code, you know, like something small could potentially set off this kind of audit. So that is another really big reason that doctors are interested in getting this right. And, you know, who does a job better? Somebody who does it, you know, for a couple hours a week or somebody who does it, you know, 40 hours a week. And I, I think that's one of the other reasons that we're seeing this trend towards outsourcing billing. Yeah, uh, I mean, from the Black Book there, you can see they've also said that the U.S. market for physician RCM, that's revenue cycle management, that's basically what we teach you to do is to manage their revenue cycle. Uh, the outsourcing is expected to report an overall 42% growth rate over the period from quarter four, that's last last quarter, to quarter one of 2019. So, Dr. Vicki, anything that has a growth rate of 42% in the next, uh, what, two years, that's got to be something worth at least investigating. <laughs> You know, I always say this is the right place and the right time to mine the treasures in the medical market. I was a little concerned about what President Trump would do, but now I think we see what the future is going to be. We are on the same path probably for years to come. Oh, yeah. 
I, I agree. Whether they call it the ACA or the ACHA, or wait, American Health H A H C A, American Healthcare Act is what they're calling it. That's the Trump Care or Ryan Care, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, it's it's basically all going to be uh, probably real similar. And so it just means that this business, which has been around for the last eight years, we had that question asked, you know, when when Obamacare, uh, the ACA, was brought into uh, American life, we, we had the question asked, well, how's that going to affect this business? Well, it didn't affect it. In fact, Dr. Vicki, our licensees right now are signing up more doctors more easily than they ever have in our history, a 23 years history. So I don't know what's going on out there right now, but I think doctors are just going, wait a minute, there's too much to keep up with here. I can't keep up with it. Please, somebody help me. And, and that's why they're opening their they're opening their offices and their doors to our licensees who are going in and, and talking to them about our, our services. I think you're exactly right, Patrick. With the increased level of complexity, this isn't a do-it-yourself do job anymore. I mean, I did a little home remodel, and I was doing just great until I took down a load-bearing wall. Oops. <laughs> and it's kind of like that for doctors. Um, there are load-bearing walls that need the experts to manage. Yeah. And, and we look for experts in all areas of our life. Doctors don't do their own bookkeeping. Probably they found a CPA to do that. They don't handle their own legal matters if they're, if they're smart. <laughs> they'll they'll have to find a lawyer for that. So uh, somebody who's an expert in revenue cycle management uh, is somebody who has been trained and continually learns and keeps up with what's going on because this industry changes. I mean, rules and regulations change all the time. That's why we tell people our license fee is a lifetime fee, meaning once you've paid that, you never pay for any other support or training or anything else from ABS. That's all included because we want to keep you up on the latest things that are going on in the industry uh, because, well, you know, Dr. Biggie, we've modeled our business so that we actually make money on the back end as well. So even though our license fee is is only 26000 we keep it that, that low because we want people to get into the business so we can make money, of course, as they sign up the doctors and, and uh, process the claims. All right, I'm moving right along here because it's three, uh, it's about, about 20 minutes we have left here. So uh, I do have the question box open there on my screen, folks, if you want to type a question in. Just think of it as you're, you're asking Dr. Vicki directly that question. So if it has to do with some of the things we're talking about here, uh, I'll read those questions out loud here. Otherwise, we'll just kind of move on through the slides. Here's a good slide here. What's the most challenging part of your job? Notice the number one choice that doctors answered was 28% of them at least, having so many rules and regulations. So just as I just mentioned, they don't want to keep up with all those rules and regulations when it comes to insurance uh, and the billing to Medicare and so forth. They'd like somebody else to handle that, and that's why uh, it's just such a great business to be in right now. They also twin, spend 20% of their time on non-clinical paperwork. That's the billing primarily. Uh, so if you're if you're using 20% of your time on something and you could cut that in half even, that would mean more money in the doctor's pocket, wouldn't it, Dr. Vicki? Uh, Absolutely. Seeing patients. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, here's a great quote. It happens to be from Brad Lung. He's a healthcare business and management association uh, president. And I'll just read the middle part there that's highlighted. He says, there is simply no entity, he's talking about third-party uh, billers, in existence, positioned to meet these needs better than the third-party medical billing companies. So, uh, again, folks, we're not saying this, not even Dr. Vicki. Uh, this is not us saying this. By the way, I, I want to make it clear that Dr. Vicki does not work for American business systems, although I would hire you in an instant if you weren't making so much money in your own business. Uh, <laughs> so we'll just make that clear that there's really only association here in that we both are trying to do the same thing, help doctors uh, to thrive in private practice. Well, I've got a lot of other quotes here that I'm going to probably uh, skip over just for now so I can get to question number two, uh, which a lot of people have in their mind. That is, is there a possibility for high profit in the business? So, again, folks, generically speaking, you want to know, uh, you know, is there a market for whatever product or service you're selling in, in the business? And number two, is there a possibility for high profit? So. I, I use this slide here because it's a good example, uh, if you do some research, that the average doctor, uh, say a, a general practitioner, uh, could do about 400 claims a month. Uh, that, that is, he would do about 100 claims a week. Uh, let's see, Dr. Vicki, that's uh, 
100 pages a week, that's 20 a day, right? So that's not a whole lot of patients, is it, for a doctor to see? Not for a primary care doctor, no. Yeah. And if, if they're averaging about $120 for each one of those visits, uh, that's $48,000 a month billed, and of course you would be collecting, uh, we've got 98% of that, but sometimes it's even more than that, but if you could just get 98% of that money, uh, you would make 7% of that, which is about $3,295 a month. In a, in a year's time, that's thirty nine. That's almost $40,000. So I know I went through that very quickly, folks, but you can see that on our website if you go right here under income potential and use our income calculator. Just plug in some numbers there. It'll tell you how to do that. And you'll see that if you could make that from one physician, one medical provider, then there's certainly a high pot profit potential in the business. Uh, I don't like to talk a whole lot about that because everybody's different, right? Some people are going to make a lot more than that. Uh, we've got licensees who are making seven figures in this business. And then there's others who, you know, they're happy with another uh, $40,000, one, one doctor. So anyway, it's, it's, uh, income is one of those things you can't really talk about because everybody's different. It's like those weight loss commercials, you know, you see that even though this person lost 300 pounds, that doesn't mean you're going to, you know. So... <laughs> <laughs> That's my disclaimer on that. Okay. Well, and then the third question that Dr. Vicki said she would ask is, is there a proven path to success? Now, I'm going to show the book that you suggested that we write together, and we just published this book here uh, the last part of last year, uh, The New Thriving Medical Practice. And, wow, folks, this is a – doctors eat this up, don't they, Dr. Vicki? They do. They really do. And so the summation of it is right there in the, in the subtitle, uh, how to get off the hamster wheel, work smarter, not harder, generate more revenue, and enjoy greater career satisfaction in the post-Obamacare era. We didn't know what else to call it right now. We are post-Obamacare, probably for sure, but even if it hung around, like you said, it's, it's not going to change that much. And so uh, all I can say, folks, is that some licensees have used this book have, have passed out this book to doctors. We'd show you how to get it in the hands of the doctor, him or herself. And once they've read, we, we teach our licensees to highlight certain things and stick little sticky tabs on those pages. When the doctor reads those things, they realize how important it is that they get their, their finances in order, in order to thrive if they want to stay in, in medical practice. And they'll call the licensees stories abound about doctors just calling them up and saying, hey, I read that chapter in the book you told me to look at, and uh, I want you to come talk to me. And then we teach them to go out and do a practice analysis to find out, you know, exactly where the doctor's practice is. But uh, this was a this was a joy to work on here, Doctor. You've got such great material in there. I, I did very little really on the book uh, because I wanted to uh, let let people see from a doctor's standpoint what a doctor really is. They're 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 struggling right now, aren't they? They really are. And as Patrick just said, I, I have no um, financial incentive to whatever choice that you make. I mean, so, you know, Patrick and I have this relationship. We're just committed to helping doctors and we're, help, we're committed to helping people like you really do well. And um, one of the things that I've so admired about you, Patrick, is your ongoing commitment to delivering value. I mean, the relationship doesn't stop after training. You are constantly working and creating new things like this book. And, you know, we're talking about all sorts of marketing plans. I won't spill the beans. Um, but so, you know, working with ABS means that you got a partner here for a long time. And, okay, so why, why do people have such a hard time? There are people who pay me like $1,000 to take my class about how to acquire doctor clients. This is free of charge for the licensees. Um, why is it? The answer is that you need specialized knowledge to be able to get in front of doctors. They are so busy. They are so distracted. You know, even if this is a pain point, if you don't do things in the right way, it's really, really hard to get a doctor's attention. So this book and other tools and techniques that you're going to learn will actually help you physically get knee to knee with doctors, which believe it or not, that's a that's like a huge thing, knowing how to do that. Yeah, so one of the 
reasons we have such a proven path of success is because over the years we have come up with tools like this one that are very unique in the marketplace. Now look, I'm going to zoom in here on this book just so you can see this uh, because you may not have seen down at the bottom, very it's very tiny type, that it says there's a forward here by Susan Smith, CMRM. Now remember at the beginning Eric told you that you'd be certified as a certified medical revenue manager. So you'll be able to put those letters after your name as well. And that will be your name, not Susan Smith's, because we figured out a way for you to actually be a part of this book. And uh, imagine, now Dr. Vicki, I'm trying to imagine having this tool back when my wife and I started doing medical billing in the late 80s, to have my name right there on the cover, having written the foreword to a book that's written by a doctor. That, that's huge. It's you can't put a value on that. Totally huge. And by the way, there are other things that are created by me that you will have access to. But just sort of, once you've got a relationship with a doctor, you're kind of part of the inner circle. Doctors are very, very tribal. You know, you're part of us or you're not, and it's very much a members only club. And just one example is that, you know, more and more doctors are going on social media. And Many doctors don't just go on LinkedIn. There's a special LinkedIn just for doctors called Doximity, and that's where most doctors go. So if you've got a relationship with a doctor, if you have written a foreword by a book that a doctor's written, you're kind of an insider. You've got the competitive advantage here. And yeah, you, I, you, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Patrick. Well, I was just going to say they, they basically have partnered with a doctor, and that means a lot to another doctor that you're marketing to, that you are somehow associated with uh, another doctor because, well, that's what they've done all their career, right, is uh, gotten mentored uh, by other doctors. Absolutely. The most influential person in a doctor's life is another doctor, and that's why this word of mouth is so powerful. You know, if one doctor just says to another doctor, wow, you should go and see Jim. He just, he transformed my practice. That's all they need. They're sold. And speaking yeah. of sold, um, right before the webinar started, I was thinking about the fact that Eric does these demos and basically he'll close the sale for licensees. And I thought, man, selling was such a struggle with me. If I had somebody else who could close my sales, man, that would have great value for me. <laughs> Yeah, let me uh, kind of expound on that. I'm glad you brought that up, Dr. Vicki, because we don't we don't bring that up enough. The fact that we actually will uh, you can you can arrange for us to do a demo for a doctor. So it boils down to this, folks. Your your goal is to get that book that we just showed you in the hands of a doctor. Uh, do the practice analysis that we teach you to do with that doctor, and then to get them to commit uh, 45 minutes of their time to actually see the technology that you have that can solve their financial revenue cycle problems. Uh, and we get online, we, uh, ABS, our staff, actually does the demo for the doctor. Now you can be on it as well, just like you're on this webinar here today. So you're there watching and listening to us give the demo, but we're doing it for the doctor and answering all the doctor's questions. Dr. Vicki, that doesn't, you can't put a value on that either. Oh man, I, that is just tremendous. So like you're not out on your own. You know, you've, you've got a team in back of you. And, you know, when I started my own consulting business, I really felt like I was on my own. And I would have loved to have had somebody help me close sales, help me with the support end. It would have made a huge difference for me. Well, and, and as you said earlier when we were talking before the webinar, Dr. Vicki, that, that people, of course, could go out and, and many people have started their own medical billing business. It's been around for years. That's no, no secret. There's lots of books and courses and things that you can take. But the difference is being a part of the nation's largest network of independent medical billing companies, which is what we are, to be a part of that and to have the backing. You, you don't ever have to worry about somebody asking a question that you can answer because you can always say, well, let me get with my insurance specialist back at my office or let me get with my IT guy at the office. Well, that's us. We have over 100 people with our technology partners that can support our licensees. And so you become a part of that and can be, appear to be much larger than you are. 
uh, you know, somebody that's working out of their spare bedroom, which a lot of our licensees do. And here's another book that Dr. Vicki wrote uh, on how physicians can get more patients. Uh, Dr. Vicki, a lot of patients uh, die, not because of the doctor, of course, but then they move away, don't they? So there is a, a nutrition thing they have to deal with. Well, uh, yes, and here's something else that's happening. You know, if you decide to work with the specialist, and I really encourage you to do that because the earning potential is so much higher, um, let's say that an orthopedic surgeon gets 20% of his patients from a given primary care doctor, and the hospital purchases that primary care doctor's office, overnight that orthopedic surgeon has lost 20% of his referral base because the hospital is going to want that primary care doctor to refer internally. So there's a lot of switching, there's a lot of consolidation, and what doctors are finding is that, you know, they, they want to know, where are my patients coming from? You know, every business wants to know, where's my next customer coming from? Even though Apple is wildly successful, you see them advertising because they want to continue the stream of customers. And this is a hot topic for doctors now, except that they don't have the business background to help them. You know, we, in medical school and residency, we, we didn't learn how to run a medical practice. We didn't learn about expert positioning or how to put <coughs> Facebook ads in. So this kind of book has been very, very helpful for doctors. Yeah, and you know, a lot of people don't realize how important it is that doctors be free to run their practice without having to, to worry about the, the revenue that's coming in on the back end. I mean, that's important. Somebody has to bill somebody for the doctor to get paid, but they don't have to be the person that's doing it. Right. Okay, I'm showing this screen here because this is our website that you've probably already been to, some of you, but you may not have looked at under the news tab right here. Let me circle that here. Uh, right here, news and then uh, the blog. You'll notice that we have a blog. Well, that's where we post recordings like this one. This is being recorded today and will be on there the next day or so. And if you scroll down, you'll see there are literally dozens of previous webinars that we've done, folks. We don't, we don't hide anything. You can come to these webinars, and some people have, for years at a time before they joined us, uh, learning all they could about the business and all the different topics that we cover in these webinars. So take advantage of that because on this blog, you'll also see interviews that I've done with some of the people that I'm going to show you right now. Yes, I actually have slides here of people who uh, I've interviewed, and I'm going to give you some little uh, glimpse into what their success has been so far. So let me uh, switch here to my pointer and click the first one here. This is Wendy and Bob uh, B. We don't use their last names on this, just so we don't want people calling all over the country to folks. but. Uh, all of these folks are available for you to talk to if you get back with your ABS coach, the person who sent you the email to come to this webinar, and you can actually talk to these people. So that was the last uh, question that Dr. Vicki had was, is there a proven path to success? Well, I'm going to show you as I, we go through these slides here that there are lots and lots of folks who have been very successful in this business, and uh, they all started off where you are. Basically, most of them had no connection to the healthcare field at all, uh, certainly no connection to the billing side of me the medical field, and yet they went out and built a, a very successful business on their own. Some of them uh, from all backgrounds, all age groups, uh, single moms, uh, retired folks, it's just amazing. If you've been to some of our classes, you've seen the variety of people that come to those. <laughs> Okay, so as I'm showing those, I'm going to go back over here to the questions because we do have some questions here and just a few minutes left. Uh, let me just get to a couple of them here. I've taken them in the order that they're coming in, folks. So uh, let's see. Well, one of the questions is from Patrick here. Another Patrick, not me. <laughs> How do you connect to the physicians and build clientele? Well, one of the ways that we showed you there was that book, but uh, Patrick, we teach about a dozen different ways in our live workshop. Uh, things that we've learned over the last 23 years as to how to connect. And, of course, part of that is uh, some of the expertise that we pull from Dr. Vicki. Dr. Vicki, you've done some great webinars for our licensees. Uh, and I can't remember the names of them, but some of them are all about cracking the, what do you call it, the cracking the physician code. Right, exactly. Yeah. 
Uh, let's see. Uh, Natish says uh, when when a group of doctors have a medical center, don't they have just one department who takes care of their billing and all the doctors? And that might be a cheaper way when all the doctors now have 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 many doctors doing it. Well, anyway, I think what she's getting at is is one one department. But but when you have several doctors, you you multiply the people that are in that department. So it's not necessarily cheaper. Uh, you, you might have for one doctor, one person, uh, for two doctors, one and a half people, and maybe for three doctors, you need another full person, so now you've got two and a half, and it, and it multiplies, and the overhead can get out of, just out of control, as you saw from that chart that I showed there earlier, uh, Natish, so let's and see. Just, yeah. just to elaborate on that, too, there are a lot of different business models, so doctors can physically be in the same place. They might not move, but if a hospital acquires them or somebody comes in and restructures, there could be restructuring in the billing process. But there are plenty of doctors, you know, a group of four cardiologists, a group of, you know, five pediatricians. There's, there are plenty of those, and those are really your best clients. <laughs> Yes, you're right, Dr. Vicki. Our, our, our target market for most of our licensees is the one to six to ten doctor groups. Uh, when it gets bigger than that, of course, you can handle that kind of billing. Uh, you just don't want to sign one of those up probably as your first client because right. then it could be a challenge there for sure. Uh, let's see. Uh, Joe says, is all the, all the money paid up front before I start my training? Yes, Joe. We, we ask for the licensing fee has to be paid up front. But we do have a money-back guarantee, which I'll show you here in just a second, that at the end of the workshop, if you don't think this is the right business for you for any reason or no reason at all, you just ask and you get all your money back. So uh, let's see. Um, I've got another question here, but I can't quite read. Let me zoom in a little bit here. Uh, okay. Well, this has to do with hospital ma uh, mergers, and a lot of hospitals do billing for doctors. Can a person... Uh, get doctors or doctors, how do I compete for business? Well, there are many of our ancillary services, Joe, that you can offer to hospitals. Uh, we, we do have a way for our licensees to do billing for hospitals. But again, this is not one of those things you want to jump into. <laughs> that could be a big, big step for you. Uh, so we get you started with the individual private practices that are out there. And then once you've got your feet wet, we'll show you that we do have billing available for the hospitals as well. So uh, that, that's just not the first thing you want to get started with. It's the same with dentists. Even though we do have a way for you to do dental billing, you don't want that to be your primary focus because, well, I don't, think, I don't think dentists see near as many patients as doctors do. I'm just guessing that, but nobody wants to go to the dentist. It depends. Um, you know, a cardiothoracic surgeon sees a fraction of the number of patients that a pediatrician would. So it just depends. Yeah. And not a whole lot of people, really, I don't think, nowadays have a dental insurance, not like, not like health insurance. Correct. It's, uh, it's one of those things that's uh, very specialized. Okay, well, Dr. Vicki, it's uh, top of the hour here. I'm going to wrap up here. There are some questions I did not get to, folks. We'll pass those on to the ABS coaches that are behind the scenes. Meanwhile, I'm going to continue showing these slides here so that you can see that there is a proven path to success. Dr. Vicki, thank you so much. This hour went by fast, didn't it? It sure did, Patrick. <laughs> uh, any parting words for folks who are still wondering whether this is something they should uh, even continue you know, doing their due diligence for? Well, I'll tell you, I, when my husband was looking at businesses and you know, he looked at the UPS store, I wish he would have found ABS. If, if we were, and he probably, we probably should have thought of that, but for whatever reason, it just didn't even cross our minds. Um, this is exactly the kind of business opportunity that I would have encouraged him to jump into. Um, and, you know, the great thing about being successful, running your own business, is that you're going to do well by doing good. There are doctors who need you. There are doctors who are committed to serving the community. You want to free them from these financial concerns so that they can do what they do well, be more profitable, and make investments in communities. So this is kind of a win all around. And um, 
I, I wish I would have thought of it years ago. <laughs> well, I'm kind of glad you did now. <laughs> Well, thanks again, Dr. Vicki. I'm going to wrap it up here with uh, our guarantee, folks, if for at the end of the training workshop, for any reason you don't think this business is right for you, simply tell any staff member, and they'll arrange for you to receive a full refund of your license fee. Can't get any better than that, can you? Nope. All right. Well, thanks again, Dr. Vicki. I look forward to doing another one of these somewhere in the near future with you as well. Okay. Thanks, Patrick. Bye-bye, everyone. Yeah.